Hi, I'm sorry. I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Video Real. Hi, Painted Black. Hi, Sherry. Hi, Dina. Hi, everybody. White Angel. Um, we're going to start with True Crime in one second. Hi, Jeanette. Hi, everybody. I'm just doing a project on my Cricut, and I want to ask something, and maybe I'll ask something while I'm getting the True Crime up. I'm making... Um, hmm. Okay, let me, I, mean, I probably want to see how many I have. I'm making something, but maybe it's going to be something that's going to center kind of on the vacation, but maybe you're somebody that wanted to have like a little, I, I don't know what you want to call a piece of the vacation, and you actually do get a piece of the vacation um, with this thing. We're having a sale Monday night. That's probably going to be the best time to show it to you. I'll show it to you, and perhaps then I'll know the number that I have that I can um, make extras and then sell them. But I may do that tomorrow, so be aware and watching for that. If that's something that you'd like, because I think they'll be pretty cool. Okay. And... This I think it'll give you, it will actually give you a little piece of, of the vacation. It'll give you a few pieces of the vacation, several, several thousand pieces of the vacation um, in a special memento. Okay, so anyway, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Hi, Christine. Wow, there's so many people here. Okay, let me get... Uh, Sorry, I, I, I was working on that, and I have to start up my Cricut again and get a few more things going. Good to see you, Jeanette. Sherry Puddin. Video Reel. Sorry if I missed anyone. Let me see. Christine, Dina, Eva Pohl. Good to see you, Jeanette. Margo, Paint It Black. Sherry, Video Reel. Everyone that's in the Zoom. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things. And don't worry about the Chad Daybell. That's just for tomorrow. We're getting prepared ahead of time. We're, we're not going to be going over Chad Daybell tonight. We're going over the true crime headlines. So there are quite a few um, stories in the news tonight. And there's some more about these two women that were killed in Oklahoma, the missing moms from Kansas. So let me get them over here because the grandmother is admitting more. Oh, come on, come on, come on, cover chatty. And we'll be live with our trial coverage tomorrow at 1030. So I hope you'll join us then. And let's see what we got here. So we've got some more court documents that um, prosecutors wrote a motion. They wanted to have Tiffany Adams held without bail. And they say that 58, 54-year-old grandmother, it, who's accused of killing Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, whose pictures are there, has allegedly admitted her involvement in this. So... Let's take a look here. Tiffany Adams did provide a recorded statement to law enforcement indicating her responsibility for the death of the dece deceased. So that was put at the end of the motion almost as an afterthought by the District Attorney George E. Leach. So Tiffany Adams provided investigators with a recorded statement that indicated her responsibility for the deaths of the deceased. And I'll read that. Let's see here. This is um, the motion that was written to hold her without bail. And it said, all persons shall be bailable by sufficient sur sureties, except that bail may be denied for capital offenses, where the proof of guilt is evident, or the presumption thereof is great, two violent offenses, 
Three, offenses where the maximum sentence sentence may be life imprisonment or life imprisonment without parole. Four, felony offenses where the person charged with the offense has been convicted of two or more felonies arising out of a different transaction. And five, controlled dangerous substances offenses where the maximum sentence may be at least 10 years imprisonment. Of all the offenses specified, in paragraphs two through five of this section, the proof of guilt must be evident or the presumption must be great and it must be on the grounds that no condition of release would assure the safety of the community or any person. And then they said the defendant's actions meet the above categories one, two, and three and thus under the Oklahoma Constitution, the denial of bail is appropriate. First degree murder is a capital offense and at this time the relevant aggravating circumstances as found is A. Continuing threat to society. The evidence shows that the defendants and co-conspirators engaged in a plot to kidnap and murder the deceased Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly in order to pre prevent the lawful granting of custody and or unsupervised visitation by the court. The defendant and conspirators attempted said crime previously by both traveling to Hugoton in an attempt to lure Veronica out of her home and additionally planning to organize her death by throwing an anvil through her windshield while she drove down the road. Uh, let's see, the aggravating circumstances okay, they can be established through introduction of evidence detailing the defendant's participation in unrelated crimes as well as the sheer callousness with which a defendant commits a particular murder. Both first degree murder and kidnapping are violent offenses. There shall be a rebuttable presumption that no condition of release would assure the safety of the community if the state shows by clear and convincing evidence that the person was arrested for a violation of section 741 of title 21 of the Oklahoma statutes. Okay. And that section is the provision regarding the crime of kidnapping, which is shown to be one of the crimes of which the defendant and the conspirators have been arrested for. And then four, the maximum sentence for murder is death, life or life without parole. The maximum sentence for kidnapping is up to 20 years. And then it said proof of guilt is evidence. See attached sworn affidavit detailing the relevant facts at this time. The state would point out that after arrest, this defendant, Tiffany Adams, did provide a recorded statement to law enforcement indicating her responsibility for the death of the deceased. Okay, and then it says, taking into consideration the rebuttable presumption and as detailed in the attached affidavit, no condition would assure the safety of the community, which includes the witnesses and court personnel involved in this case. So they asked for Nobel, and here we have, let's see what this is, um, the affidavit. So let's see what the affidavit says here. On Saturday, March 30th, 2024, the Texas County Sheriff's Office requested Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation services with the suspicious disappearance of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly, 27 and 37 respectively, from rural Texas County after their vehicle was found abandoned near Highway 95 and Road L, south of Elkhart, Kansas. Butler and Kelly were traveling to Oklahoma from Yugaton. Interviews were conducted related to this disappearance, and it was discovered that Butler was in a problematic custody battle with Tiffany Adams for the custody of Butler's two children. The father of those two children was Wrangler Rickman, Adams' son. She named her son Wrangler Rickman, wow. Butler's visitation with her children was ordered to be supervised every Saturday. Adams had a particular person she preferred to supervise those visitations, and that was Cheryl Brune. So this lady, she had a certain person that she used to supervise the visitation, but then when they were coming, she just said, oh, yeah, I can't get that person to supervise that. She's unavailable to supervise it on March 30th, on March 30th. So Butler was required to arrange for supervision with one of her three appro approved uh, individuals. And, oh boy, you know, 
talk about drawing a short straw that Butler contacted Kelly and planned to have her supervise the visit. Well, we know what the plan was, right? So she told her, Veronica said to her family members, I'm going to pick up my kids. And they're going, right? And they never, they never are heard from again. And then their car is found. And then there's a lot of blood and everything by the car. We've went through this affidavit, all of that. So I'm just trying to see if they, then their bodies were found. And then four people were arrested. I'm trying to see if this has anything else that she says here. And this was all done because she, the, the mother was going to get custody or unsupervised visitation of the kids. And mm, that wasn't, you know, like these custody battles. I mean, come on now, you don't kill people. Really? My gosh. But so that's the mother saying that, huh? And then we have um, another arrest here, father and son. So the son of the Florida man charged with killing his wife in January has now been charged with accessory after the fact and tampering with evidence. Lane Estep, 18, was arrested the day after his father last month and charged with arson for setting his father's truck on fire after police came to speak with Brian Estep about his missing wife, Amber Estep. Amber's mother reported her missing on January 19th. Deputies spoke with Brian, the father, that day, and he told them, he got into his argument with his wife when they returned from a medical appointment and he let her out of the truck. Remember this story? We covered this. And she had just asked to get out of the car somewhere along Interstate 95. Okay? So that was his story. Yeah, we coming back from a medical appointment. We're in a fight. She's like, let me out of the car. So I let her out of the car on, on Interstate 95. Hours later, Brian Estep's pickup truck was found a blaze in Port St. John. Now, the son, Lane, was found ouch, hold on a minute, stupid thing went here, at the scene of the fire. But he told investigators he was just there to take pictures. Yeah. And that the fire was caused by a defect in the truck that was under recall. Okay. Imagine that one. Okay. Just imagine talking to these two, right? So do you know where your wife is? Um, yeah, uh, I don't. I wish I did. We came back from a medical appointment. They started a fight with me. So how we had some words. All of a sudden, she's like, let me out. Let me out. So I just let her out on the side of 95. Yeah. And then they come across, you know, his truck that he was driving that day, just blazing on fire and you find the sun there son what are you doing here oh, I'm just here I'm just taking pictures because this fire this fire started because this truck had a recall and uh, they said this was going to happen so I'm just taking I just want to document this for the insurance company <laughs> just can't even believe this okay so Investigators found there was no fire-related recall in the truck. Surprising, isn't it? The next day, the mother, Amber Estep, the wife, mother, her remains were found in a remote area off of State Route 46 in Mims, and she had been shot multiple times and also had head trauma. The father, husband, Brian was arrested, charged with first-degree murder and tampering with evidence on March 28th in West Virginia. You know, he had abruptly moved to West Virginia after his wife's body was found. Oh, sir, now you're living in West Virginia from Florida? Oh, yeah, I just decided to make a quick move after my wife's body was found. Then the son, Lane, was arrested the next day, also in West Virginia, and charged with second-degree arson. 
The new charges were filed last week after investigators put together witness reports and crime scene analysis. Father and son extradited back to Florida. Come on, boys, you're not going to West Virginia. You're back in Florida. Okay, and they're both due back in court on May 30th. So, great, great, guys. It's really bang up job. And uh, this, is, this is what I mean. People have to be learn how to solve problems. Murder is not going to solve your problems. It's only going to create more. Okay, now, remember the little boys that were killed when that wife of that, well, estranged wife of that plastic surgeon went flying through um, crosswalk while the whole family was crossing and yeah so a California judge declined to revoke phone privileges for her after she was convicted in February of running over the two young brothers and killing them while speeding through an intersection back in 2020. Judge Superior Court Judge Joseph A. Brandolino cited what he called Rebecca Grossman's naivete in demanding that her husband and daughter release videos that are under seal and other conversations that prosecutors have amounted to various attempts to interfere with witnesses and their testimony and attempts to influence the judge in regards to sentencing and motions for a new trial. And the judge said, and I quote, I'm not going to restrict any of her privileges, but he did warn her that he could change his mind if he determines that she is tampering with witnesses. And I, he said again, and I quote, I think there's a lot of naivete going on here by the defendant. She's upset and she's naive. She's entitled to her beliefs. Deputy District Attorney Jamie Castro disagreed noting that she and her plastic surgeon husband are paying for 10 defense attorneys to advise her. She should know better, Your Honor, Castro said. Grossman was found guilty of second-degree murder and other crimes on February 23rd. She's now scheduled to be sentenced on June 10th. There's a two-month delay from the original sentencing date while her attorneys seek a new trial. A hearing on that request is set for June 3rd. Grossman has been behind bars since a jury convicted her of killing 11-year-old Mark Iskander and his brother 8-year-old Jacob Iskander as they crossed an intersection with their family on September 29, 2020. She had been out drinking with her lover, who is Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Scott Erickson, when they were... And, and, hmm, they were driving in separate cars to another location when they were both speeding through the intersection and she slammed into the boys and then she didn't stop. She kept driving until her vehicle actually shut down and would not start again. She insisted that the lover, Erickson, hit the kids. In one phone call cited by prosecutors, she demanded that her husband call Scott Erickson and tell him to get on a video and that he needs to confess. I have a family. I know he needs to confess, but right now I can't even talk about the case. But that guy needs to. You're in jail for him, and it drives me crazy. That's her husband, who I just quoted, who told his wife, they have to stop talking about the case on the recorded line. Now, Erickson, the lover, was not called to testify in Grossman's trial by either prosecutors or the defense. The phone call about Erickson came two days after Grossman's conviction. The prosecutor cited other phone calls made between February 23rd and 25th in their request to revoke her phone privileges. In particular, she told her daughter to unblock the videos and put everything out, referring to videos that are under seal. Her attorney argued that she thought the videos could be released now that the trial was over, but Brandolino told her that the orders sealing the videos still remain in place. He said if any of the material is released, it could result in revocation of the privileges in monetary sanctions and a report to the California Bar against her attorneys.
So there was a Florida, another Florida case, right? Uh, anywhere else? Where a six-year-old was abducted at knife point during a home invasion. And here we could see, thankfully, she's being rescued. Four women were arrested Saturday after they abducted a six-year-old child from another woman at Knife Point in Florida. In Melbourne, police were called to a home in South Melbourne just before 11 a.m. And the victim told them the women attacked and threatened her with a knife and they took the child in an SUV. The SUV had Alabama plates and they say they believe the women are related to the child's father who lives out of state. After putting out a statewide bulletin, the deputies from Columbia County Sheriff's Office saw the vehicle. They saw it and captured it heading west on Interstate 10, about 200 miles away. They were able to make a stop on that vehicle and they recovered the child and they detained the suspects. The suspects were later identified as Eva Leonora Akal, 32 years old, and Ingris Akal, 22, and Marsha Akal, 30, and Delia Pop Tech Akal, 24. They have been charged with home invasion robbery, grand theft from a dwelling, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, kidnapping, child abuse, and unlawful possession of the personal identification information of another person. The child was reunited with their mother and she was not physically injured, thankfully. Suspects are all being returned to Brevard County for trial. Film re reunion over there, huh? Okay, another Florida case. Florida. Florida's in trouble. Florida's scary. Okay. 17 year old boy shot and killed a 14 year old girl and then himself at a house where he was dog sitting Saturday evening. Pinellas County Sheriff's Office said that Hector Pfeffer invited three teenagers, two girls and an 18-year-old boy, to the home of 26-year-old Derek Pobuta, where he was staying to watch their dog while the homeowner was out of town. The teens came over at about 4 a.m. on Saturday. They drank alcohol, they smoked marijuana, and they used cocaine throughout the day. Deputies say that Pfeiffer met the two girls on a social media app about a month before. He was already friends with the 18-year-old. In the course of the day, Pfeiffer took out a firearm that belonged to the homeowner, and soon all four began playing with it and taking photos with it. Eventually, the teenagers who were <laughs> under the influence of drugs and alcohol got into an argument over a consensual S encounter that Pfeiffer had, which upset him. Detectives say he walked over to where the 14-year-old Sayura Jade Ruiz was talking with the other girl and shot Ruiz in the head, and then he shot himself in the head. Deputies received a 911 call just before 9 p.m. where they arrived to find Ruiz dead. Pfeiffer was still breathing. However, he was taken to a hospital where he died. The investigation is ongoing, of course. Not clear what charges will be filed given that the perpetrator killed himself. Medical examiner is conducting an autopsy. Well, what about the other girl? And boy, what is going on there? That's just crazy.
And this is horrible. This is, again, going out to have a really good time, right? It's like when people get killed in freak accidents, they're at an amusement park, they're somewhere where it's supposed to be really fun. You're having a really great time, like that horrible thing that happened in Walt Disney World where that little boy got taken by, I can't even taken by that alligator that oh my gosh oh my gosh that that, that trauma that, that oh my gosh but everything is supposed to be great right you're staying at this disney resort it's beautiful you have this special event you've spent a lot of money in this and this is supposed to be you know oh this is a great great vacation this is what's going to and something so horrific as that happens. Well, this is another thing, a birthday party, right? A happy occasion. Happy occasion, no, doesn't end that way because an eight-year-old and a five-year-old brother, family lost two children. They lost their eight-year-old and their five-year-old in Michigan. They were killed Saturday afternoon when a drunk driver slammed into the building where the birthday party was taking place. Three children and six adults were taken by ambulance or medical helicopters to area hospitals with serious injuries. Monroe County Sheriff Troy Goodenough said several more people were taken for treatment in private vehicles. Fifteen people were treated on the scene of the Swan Boat Club in Berlin Township. The scene was described by the first responders as extremely chaotic with high levels of emotion of those directly involved and those who witnessed the horrific incident. The vehicle was driven by a 66-year-old woman. She rammed the north wall of the building and her vehicle didn't stop until it was 25 feet inside. The woman's name was not released, but she is in jail on a charge of operating a vehicle while intoxicated, causing death. And Goodenough said more charges are expected. Surveillance video showed this vehicle speeding across the parking lot area just before the crash. There it is right there. You can see it right here. The driver was cooperative at this scene. And the sheriff and the French town township fire chief said investigators were not sure how many people were in the building at the time of the crash. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. See, do you, do you think that? That's not something that you think about happening, right? And look at that. It was a Saturday. We're having a birthday party. And the family's lost their two children. It could be their whole their whole family. I, I don't know how many children they have. In one second, their kids' lives wiped out. Because of a decision of this woman to get behind the wheel... after, you know, she's drunk, she's under the influence of alcohol. That decision, and I don't know where she was going, like, what, did she even know, like, did she have any business at this party? What was she doing there? Um, let me see if I... Let's see here. Um, crash happened at about 3 p.m., Terrible. Where's that family? And then we have a missing. Of 
girl here who disappeared while walking to school. Let's see. She's in Utah. Her loved ones are speaking out in hopes of delivering a message to her. Friday, April 19th, Aliyah Rose Cabrera Utai was dropped off at Mount Jordan Middle School in Sandy and walked out of the building 30 minutes later. The school cameras recorded the 13-year-old leaving the school and running across the street. She was later seen around 1 p.m. walking past her grandmother's house in Midville which was south of Salt Lake City, but there's no indication that she went inside her grandmother's house. Family members have learned from the girl's friends that someone else may be involved in the situation, but that's not been officially confirmed. Her relatives are doing what they can to try to communicate with her. Her aunt said, and I quote, I want her personally to know that she is loved and that we are wanting to welcome her home. For her to just fall off the face of the earth is just not normal. Alia, who lives in Midvale, Midvale, is described as 5'3", 105 pounds, brown hair and brown eyes. At the time she went missing, she was wearing a white shirt, tan pants, and black shoes. She also has a brown shoulder bag. Authorities say... Alaya has been known to travel on tracks, a light rail system in Utah, and her mother has asked the transit provider to check whether her daughter was spotted on any of the cameras. The aunt says it's unlike her niece to be out of contact for so long and that she seemed to be in good spirits earlier in the week. The family was going to travel for a vacation on Saturday. The aunt says... She just wants to make sure Aliyah is okay. And I quote her saying, first and foremost, the only priority we care about is that she's safe and that she knows she's welcome to come home. To report information on the girl's whereabouts or anything else, call the Unified Police Department at 801-840-4000. New York party boat sounds like a good time, right? Let's go on a New York party boat. Several people were stabbed late Saturday afternoon when a fight broke out at a party boat on the Brooklyn Pier. Police and fire officials responded to Pier 4 at the Brooklyn Army Terminal and found at least two stabbing victims, 32-year-old man and 40-year-old man, but no perpetrator. The old man had stab wounds in his chest an abdomen and the younger man was stabbed in the torso. A 28-year-old man was hit on the head with a bottle and taken to the hospital. Two other people were injured, but they didn't want treatment. They refused it. Police say the whole thing took place aboard the yacht Cornucopia Majesty. There was a lot of pushing and shoving, one passenger said. The three victims were said to be in stable condition. They did not say what started everything. Another person that did not learn how to solve a problem because murder is not the answer. So Florida man again, he was arrested this week after he gunned down his wife at his parents house and then he chased the ambulance taking her to the hospital in his Cadillac Cadillac Devin Hansen 28 has been charged with first degree murder domestic battery fleeing and eluding and obstructing justice he was ordered held without bond at a court appearance on Thursday and 
he asked the judge, and I quote, So I have to stay in custody? The judge said, Yes, sir. He got into an argument with his wife, Yasmin, and shot her at about 10.30 p.m. on Wednesday. By the time the police arrived, he had left the scene in his black Cadillac. First responders loaded Yasmin into an ambulance and took, they were heading for the hospital, but the officer who was riding along with the ambulance noticed that a black Cadillac was following them down the interstate. We knew he was armed, we knew he was dangerous, we knew he was violent, and he was following very closely. That was considered a threat. That's when officers tried to pull him over and he took off. Officers pursued him in a chase and he left the interstate before he crashed into landscaping rocks and when he did he was taken into custody. Yes, that's the end of the black Cadillac. But he killed his wife. Crazy. Iowa. We don't hear a lot of crimes in Iowa. There's Molly Tibbetts, uh, but police in Iowa are searching for a 29-year-old man who's wanted for the murders of a man and a woman who were found dead at their rural Marshall County home on Friday. So the Marshall County Sheriff's Office was performing a welfare check on the home, and they found Mario Murillo and Francis Tilly Gasca, 28 and 33 respectively, deceased. Deputies working with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation identified Ilias Julian Lasley as the suspect and they're charging him with two counts of first degree murder. Mr. Lastly is considered armed and dangerous, the sheriff's office said. If you see him or know his location, do not approach him, but call law enforcement. Sheriff's office provided no further information about the murders or their investigation. And I guess he could look either way. Oh, look at this. Remember that dentist, that uh, dentist, he was making all those videos. He thought he was like really hot stuff. He poisoned his wife. They had a lot of kids, remember, in Colorado. We covered this extensively. There's some more news here from this guy. He is accused of trying to tamper with evidence from behind bars. 46-year-old James Craig is charged with first-degree murder in the death of his wife, 43-year-old Angela Craig. That happened on March 18, 2023. I believe that was only a year ago. Investigators allege that Angela died from consuming lethal levels of tetrahydroxylene, a decongestant, commonly used in eye drops and cyanide. Remember this one? He was making her all these shakes. She was going to the hospital. Remember this? This case? Yeah. We covered this extensively. You can look back on our other videos. He allegedly purchased this cyanide and arsenic days before Angela died and had searched the internet for how to commit poisoning. Around the time of her murder he was dealing with a lot of financial troubles and guess what he was having a, an affair prosecutors later charged james in june of 2023 
with one count of solicitation to commit tampering with physical evidence for allegedly trying to convince one of his daughters to help him cover up the crime between March 18th, 2023 and March 31st, 2023. Now, the Arapahoe County District Attorney's Office has filed an amended complaint where they charged James with another count of evidence tampering. Details in the court filing are limited, but the document accuses James of trying to persuade an unnamed individual to tamper with evidence between March 18, 2023 and June 15, 2023. He was arrested and booked into jail on March 18, 2023, and he is being held on a $10 million cash-only bond. They, have, they had six children, James and Angela, and they were married for more than 20 years. Angela's brother, Mark Prey, explained the toll that his sister's murder has had on the family, saying, and I quote, the heinous actions of her killer have left a void in the lives of her children, our family, her countless friends in the world, depriving us of Angie's love and light. James pled not guilty to the murder charge, and he's scheduled to go to trial in August. Oh, believe me, you, I will be watching and covering that trial. So much, so much. Dodge gas. What is that about? Let me see here. James and Jennifer Crumley. They wanted to avoid jail. We know that. Okay, they didn't. They got. Okay, let's see what happened here in Texas. Oh my goodness. There's a newly released affidavit, arrest affidavit, providing additional details in connection with the murder of a 27-year-old mother in Dallas in her apartment last week. Through this document, we can see that a witness told police that the man accused of murdering Karina Johnson had wrapped her in bedding and placed her in a closet in his apartment. That suspect is a 34-year-old Omar Lucio. He is now charged with her murder the witness approached the Garland police station early Monday reporting a suspected homicide that occurred around 24 hours earlier in an apartment on the West Wheatland Road. Garland police notified Dallas police. They dispatched officers to the apartment. The suspect initially refused to exit but complied at about 3 a.m. When they entered the apartment, officers saw a bloody trail in multiple rooms. An officer detailed that the woman's body was bludgeoned and still at the location. Inside the suspect's vehicle, they found clothing with apparent blood stains on them. Meanwhile, the witness informed a detective that she had known Lucio for about six months and occasionally met up with him. On the Sunday in question, Lucio allegedly messaged her around 1 a.m requesting him, excuse me, requesting her to pick him up, claiming he did not want to return home. After picking him up, the witness claimed that Lucio said he was with Johnson at a downtown Dallas bar, but that he became upset when they were kicked out. And he subsequently attacked her, because that's how he solved problems. The witness stated the suspect told her that he had put his hands on her, and that he had to knock some sense into her, and she became unresponsive. Wow, okay. 
The defendant then asked the witness to bring him back to the apartment to check on Johnson, and that's when they found her unconscious. Lucio later told police that he brought her upstairs, hoping she would wake up. He reportedly whispered it would be okay, but then discovered she wasn't breathing. He also allegedly admitted to having temper issues and that he just snapped while confronting Johnson. Erica Hernandez, Johnson's older sister, said the victim had been in a relationship with Lucio for about six or seven years and was in a domestic violence situation. She leaves behind a seven-year-old son. I think, um, let me get back to where you guys are. Hold on, hold on. I'm trying to get back there. Okay, I'm back here. Hello. I put in. Hello, Sassy. Hi, hi, 61. Haven't seen you in a few days. Okay, so. She died from DV in the closet. Yep. Yes, she did. He looks scary too. Watch. Let's see if Carolyn shows his mugshot. You want to see his mugshot? I will show it to you. He looks like a um, smug uh, kind of guy you want to just wipe the smirk off his face, right? Detectives noted in the affidavit that Lucio's hands appeared injured. He had blood under his fingernails and on his left shoe. They noticed that Lucio did not tell investigators how Johnson ended up in his closet, wrapped in the bedding. And Johnson's family had been urging her to leave him. Let's see. Erica Hernandez, Johnson's sister, said that her sister was the most bubbly person ever. And her aunt said that she always had a smile on her face. She didn't deserve what she More got, not at all. Be quiet. They were out drinking. They got kicked out of a bar. This is what he said because of Johnson. And then he allegedly knocked some sense into her, making her unresponsive. What a guy. What a guy. Yeah, he looks horrible. Just horrible. 
Okay, and um, I'm not sure where. Hold on a second. It's uh, two thirty in the morning. Hello, Bucky Ann, and paint it black. And everybody, my cat, my chat is catching up. Oh no, it's uh, well. I know you're asking what I mentioned. I'll show you tomorrow at the sale. Tomorrow, I'll show you at the sale on what. Uh, it, depending on how many I've got to make some more. What a way to go. Okay, poor Liddy. I know. But I think now we have to wind down, play a quick daily puzzle, and then go to bed because we're going to be wrapped up in the trial and then the sale and then who knows what, right? Because we're going to have our auction because I've got um, obligations for Wednesday that would make it me having to rush back for an auction and I just can't do that. I've got you read that thing that she was with him for six years but you know the cycle of abuse it's hard to get them out. Yeah it's hard well, I know. Oh, look, Binks. Binks, you're in the puzzle tonight. Look, Binks. Binks is in the puzzle. Okay. I collected the puzzle. I don't even know what that at all means, you know? You emailed me video? Okay. Good night, White Angel. You're welcome, Dina. What a, um, got bikinis, nibs, the candy. No, 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 no. She's not here, Putin. She's not here, but she was in the puzzle. Her name. 
Get it? Her name was there. Do you get it? Tried all those. I tried Leo, I tried Cop. Pop is not there. Crazy. I gotta go to bed though because I've got to uh
Wallaby. That's for uh, Deborah Wallaby. Today, the twenty second, dang it. Okay, well, I'm going to call that a night. We finish it with a bang. Thank you. See you guys later. Love you guys. God bless. Good night. See you later. Bye bye. Be good prayers and be good people. See you later. Good night, guys. Thank you for watching. Appreciate it.